All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Justin Ging. I'm the Chief Product Officer for Atom Computing, and it's my pleasure to introduce our company to you today. So our mission at Atom Computing is to deliver the most scalable quantum computing hardware that we can. So we make gate-based quantum computing hardware based on neutral atom technology. Uh, and we are a startup company. So uh, we got our S Series C funding uh, late last year, and we're using that money to grow our team and to build commercial systems, uh, which we'll launch as a cloud service, uh, similar to many. So this is a photo of our team that was taken almost exactly one year ago. And since then, we've more than doubled our team size. You'll notice I'm not in that picture <laughs> that was from a year ago. Uh, and we're, uh, we're continuing to grow through the year. So we see the benefits, like many who have spoken uh, at the conference, of uh, the world-changing applications that Quantum can provide. And we see our role in this as providing the, the very best tools uh, and unique capabilities so that people can develop towards these goals and kind of accelerate to those applications. And we see quantum computing as a journey. So there was a time when uh, quantum computers had been proposed theoretically, but they didn't exist. And so there was questions, well, can they actually be built? And uh, one of the big milestones was mentioned yesterday. IBM launched systems in 2016 and said, yes, they can be built. And uh, it, was, it was huge for the industry. But then people said, well, yeah, they're a little bit error prone. So can you really make it, the fidelity high enough to matter? And some of the trapped ion groups came along and said, yes, with atom-based uh, qubits, yes, we can. We can make very high fidelity qubits, and we have a path to getting better. Uh, and now the question these days seems to be, can you scale? Can this technology reach the number of qubits that we need and the capabilities and the performance? And that's what Atom is about. Our path to scaling is uh, very straightforward, and I'll describe more about that technology as we go. And we're continuing on this journey with uh, these kinds of increased resources to be able to address the applications and eventually get to this commercial viability. So to give you a better idea of where Atom sits in the large ecosystem of quantum, I'm, uh, borrowing this uh, market map from courtesy of the Quantum Insider. So you'll see that there are uh, a range of things starting from the right side with the components, people, uh, companies providing those pieces that are needed to build systems. Then there's the, the quantum hardware itself, the QPUs, a number of different technologies and companies. Uh, and then through many layers of software stack, uh, some of the software to actually help build the systems, uh, layers on top of that to help build the applications. And then at the far end, uh, people in the industry, people with applications uh, to be able to apply quantum. Uh, so we sit within the hardware space. We're particularly focused on the hardware. Um, our goal is not to be full stack like some of the companies are. We're, we're at this time, we feel that the best way that we can interact in the ecosystem is to just focus on that hardware and partner with a number of players. So we think it gives us a lot more opportunity to be flexible and uh, to, to be more widely available to researchers. So within that hardware space, we're doing neutral atoms. And uh, you may feel that neutral atoms is, uh, is getting a little bit more chatter recently, like, oh, where are neutral atoms? Is this a new technology? Well, it turns out it's not a new technology. It's been around for quite a while. So some of the fundamental technologies that are used to build neutral atom systems were developed in the late 1970s and 1980s. And these were amazing breakthroughs in science. These are things that eventually won Nobel Prizes, things like uh, optical tweezers and laser cooling atom trapping. And uh, even the proposal of using neutral atoms for quantum computers was proposed in 1999. Uh, at that time, laid out the whole plan of here's how we can do it. But it was difficult at that time to realize it. So fast forward a couple decades later, and we're now able to pull all these pieces together and build system. So a little bit more about our technology. So we use uh, the nuclear spin of atoms for our qubits. So this is different than some of the other neutral atom companies where they'll use the spin of electrons. But we use the nuclear spin. Uh, so we use alkaline earth metals uh, instead of alkali metals. And that has 
a complete or closed electron shell. That provides protection, natural protection in the atom from that nuclear spin. So um, if there are stray magnetic fields, it gets shielded out. And that allows us to have very long coherence times. So we, released, we recently released a paper uh, where we achieved record-breaking 40-second coherence times, very long coherence, because that nuclear spin is very protected. Uh, with long coherence times, you can do things like hybrid applications where you want to do some quantum, pause, go over, use your classical, figure out what to do next, come back to it, continue on. Uh, and it's also very important for quantum error correction to have long coherence times. So now into the, the meat of how our system works. So uh, three big steps here, and I'll, I'll focus on each one. So we start by preparing our atoms. So uh, our prototype system uses strontium. So we heat up some strontium metal. Uh, a stream of atoms comes out. They're very fast moving. And we use uh, magnetic field and lasers on those atoms to slow those down. Uh, this is not cryogenic cooling, it's, it's laser cooling. It's uh, essentially uh, slowing these to a near stop. And if you think about heat, heat is really just a measure of uh, that vibrational motion. And we're stopping that motion. So essentially we're cooling these atoms down. And so you may have heard the term cold atoms. That's where it gets its name. They're, they are indeed cold. They're in the micro Kelvin type level. Uh, in near stop, and we form a cloud of those. In parallel, we make a, an array of optical tweezer traps. So an optical tweezer is essentially a very finely focused laser beam that has a very intense spot. And when a particle or an atom gets stuck into that, uh, that focal point, uh, the field interaction holds that atom in. And uh, the lowest potential energy turns out to be right at that center point. And so it, is, it has trapped or, or hold, it holds that atom. And so uh, we create an array of these tweezers to, uh, to capture the atoms. Now, it may seem like we need to have individual laser tweezers for each of these, but we actually create out of one laser. We take that one laser and we form it into, we basically divide it out into uh, small laser tweezers. You may have seen a laser pointer that has little attachments on it. You can kind of screw on the attachment so you can make a star pattern or a smiley face. Similar kind of concept for how we're doing this with our grid of uh, 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 the uh, tweezers, uh, except that we're using a spatial light modulator to adjust the phase and create that interference pattern. And that's electronically controlled, so while we're doing a very precisely spaced grid, it's possible that as we work with collaborators that perhaps they propose a different shape. Let's say, hypothetically, uh, some kind of hexagonal honeycomb. We can very easily rearrange our, our optical tweezer array to accommodate that. So we've got our array. Uh, we take our, our cloud of cold atoms. We uh, release that cloud into that array. And some of those spots get filled. And for the remaining ones, we use a dynamic tweezer, essentially an aimed tweezer that can pick up and move atoms into the remaining spots so that we have a nice, clean, fully filled array. Now we're ready to do our computations. So quantum op operations are single and two qubit gates. So for single qubit gates, we use uh, laser pulses. And we are able to uh, do an entire row of single qubit gates at the same time. They each can have their own, oh, let me, uh, sorry about that. Uh, they can have their own uh, rotation on the block sphere. They don't all have to be the same rotation. Um, we can do that entire rows at a time. Now, two qubit gates get interesting. So our atoms are spaced far enough apart that they, they don't see each other, uh, um, that they don't interact. So to get them to interact, we excite them to a Rydberg state, which means essentially the, that uh, radius of where the electron is gets pushed way out so that it now can interact with, uh, with the other atoms that are nearby. So with that uh, Rydberg interaction, now they can interact and we can do the two qubit gates within that. So with the single qubit gates, two qubit gates, we can do our quantum circuit, run through all of those gates, and in the end, we want to read it out. So uh, we set up that, uh, we illuminate that array. We do that measurement operation. And we can read out the results with a camera. Certain qubits that are ones will fluoresce and glow, make a spot. And ones that are zeros will 
will not. And so with that camera readout, we can get the results. And then we can reinitialize those atoms back to zeros and then run additional computation. And if ever an atom is lost somewhere in there, uh, we can just use a dynamic tweezer to refill that spot and continue on. So what does that look like as a system? Well, it's a room-sized system, uh, full optics table, lasers, bulk optics, vacuum chamber. Um, and if you were to peek down inside, you would see a glass cell where all the action is happening. So uh, inside that blue area is where the, the array is. And this is all increasingly automated. So in an ideal state, uh, when things are going well, the, the lights are off, the doors are closed, no one's inside the lab, and people can operate it remotely. So how do we scale? How is it so scalable? Well, we start with the idea that we have a 10 by 10 array for our 100 qubits. Uh, it's pretty straightforward to see that we can expand in two dimensions. So we can go to... Uh, let's say 100 by 100 to get 1,000, or sorry, 10,000 qubits. And at some point, it makes sense to not just expand in two dimensions, but also three, to have layers of these array. So moving to a volume uh, of 3D. Now, if you think about it here, that's a million qubits. Uh, each of these atoms spaced at about four microns apart means that that million qubits is sitting in less than a tenth of a millimeter cube space. Now, that's not any kind of modularity. There's no optical interconnects. That's one system. And as that scales up, the number of qubits, that room size system stays approximately that same room size system. So huge scalability uh, in a very small amount of space. So it was said earlier, number of qubits isn't everything. We totally agree. Getting a number of qubits is very important but there are a number of other metrics that are really important too. And this doesn't even capture all of them, but these are some of the important ones. And if someone is going to compare systems, they're going to take a look at kind of holistically, how does a system perform on all of these metrics? And the idea is uh, that we'd want to expand out on all these fronts. So system A and B here are just hypothetical systems that uh, someone could uh, evaluate what, what are the capabilities of these systems. But our goal, regardless, is really just to push on all of these, uh, make sure that uh, it's not just the number of qubits, but the fidelity is high, that we can move fast, uh, have lots of connectivity, uh, long coherence. And we'll continue to provide the best hardware that we can, make improvements. And we really want to partner. So uh, we look forward to working with collaborators, software developers, algorithm developers. Um, folks who are making components that, that could contribute. Uh, really looking forward to that. Uh, so if you think there's some potential that we could work together, I encourage you to reach out. Uh, here is, uh, please reach out on the email or perhaps after my talk. I uh, would love to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you.